welcome to yet another exciting session uh, with Gayatri and Pallavi from ThoughtWorks. Uh, and uh, uh, this topic seems to be very interesting for me, as I said. Uh, today's topic is how to approach continuous testing of cross-functional requirements. I won't waste much time. Over to you guys. Thank you, Abhijit. I'll share my screen right now. So once again, welcome everyone. Uh, it's so joyful to see a lot of participants already in the room. Um, so welcome once again from me and Pallavi. So as uh, Abhijit has already introduced the topic, we're going to talk about continuous testing of cross-functional requirements. Quick introductions. Um, so myself, uh, I'm Gayatri Mohan. Uh, I'm a principal quality analyst at ThoughtWorks. Uh, I also played the role of global QASME at ThoughtWorks Capabilities, mainly crafting uh, career pathways for the QAs and the company. Uh, I'm also a member of the Tech Advisory Board at ThoughtWorks India. I recently released a book called Full Stack Testing with O'Reilly. Um, so Pallavi is my colleague. Pallavi, would you like to give one a short intro about yourself? Yes, thanks, Dayatri. Hi, everyone. I'm Pallavi Vadlamani. I'm a lead quality analyst at ThoughtWorks. I also play the role of a delivery principal. Uh, I've recently moved to Milan and I'm enjoying the European summer, uh, but right now I'm based out of Milan. Uh, all right, I think uh, that's all with the introductions. Uh, let's quickly take a look at today's agenda. Um, today, we'll, we'll start off with uh, an introduction to the cross-functional requirements, uh, then we'll uh, talk about a little about continuous testing, and then we'll see how to the, apply the continuous testing and the strategy for the cross-functional requirements. And then we will be delving deeper and applying, uh, talking about a strategy for continuous testing, two of the cross-functional requirements, security and accessibility, uh, post which we'll take Q&A, and uh, that, that's the agenda for today. All right. Um, Let's get started. Introduction to CFRs is like, like uh, agenda says. Uh, before uh, I talk about uh, the, uh, CFRs, I wanted to understand from you how many of you have uh, worked on CFRs or have an idea or context about cross-functional requirements. All right, I think uh, there probably are a mix of responses. Some of you have all, uh, are familiar with the term and some of you say that you do not have the exposure. We hope today's session introduces you to the world of CFRs and why it, uh, the importance of uh, including them in your test strategy. Uh, let us start uh, talking about CFRs with, a, with an example of a, a simple uh, three-tier e-commerce web applications architecture, like an Amazon. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about C CFRs in reference to an uh, e-commerce web application. Like you see, this is a very simple uh, architecture. It has three layers, the user interface layer, the services layer, and a database. The services, uh, there are three different types of services. One is the identity and access management services, which, which handles all the authentication and authorization of the requests that are coming in. The order service, which handles all order management, be it creating orders, modifying orders, or deleting orders. And then we finally have the payment service, which handles um, your payment requests, cancellations, refunds, et cetera, right? Now, uh, now uh, let us take a look at what the functional requirements for this e-commerce application would be. Functional requirements are usually prioritized and driven by the business. So some of the functional requirements would be that the user should be able to log in and browse the product catalog. They should be able to purchase an item and get it successfully delivered. It uh, should also be able to manage and take a look at the order space, do a lot of tracking of the orders. Uh, while these are some of the functional requirements, there are many more that are discussed during the design phase and ideation phase of the application and are considered and, and, and the application is built. But are these requirements enough for us to say that our application is ready for users? Of, of, uh, is it just enough to build these, right? Now let's say that you're trying to add a product to a card and it is taking you more than two minutes for the product to get added to the card. Or You make your payment, you get through the order and you finish the order and all your details of the card are available on the internet. In both of the above scenarios, the functional requirements are still valid and you're able to add a product to the card, you're still able to pay for it, but they add little or no value because 
your either your profile details are exposed or it is taking forever for you to actually add a product to cart. Would someone continue? Would, would we all be happy using an application like this? At least I from my end, I think most of us would not be very happy using an application if our details are exposed or sensitive data is available for the public, right? That if you could. This is where the CFRs come into picture, CFRs or the cross-functional requirements for uh, for any application. And in the scenarios we've spoken about, it would be uh, it would be that any action taken on the application should complete within X seconds. Or for, in terms of sensitive data, the CFR for the application would be that the user stores and transmits all of the data, not just the card details, but also all the profile details, the addresses, the telephone number, and any sensitive data of the user should be transmitted and saved securely. Now let's take a look at uh, the definition of cross-functional requirements, right? Cross-functional requirements, uh, as the name says, are requirements that cut across the entire application are, and they cut across all the functional requirements and they need to be built into every functional feature to achieve a high quality application. As, as you can see on the on the service uh, architecture diagram on the right, uh, we, we have CFRs cutting through each of the layers and each of the functional features. As evident as it is that the functional requirements refer to the core business services offered to the customers, cross-functional re requirements refer to the executional and evolutionary qualities of an application. When I say executional qualities, I'm talking about the behavior of the application during runtime, such as uh, some of the ex executional qualities are availability, authentication, monitoring, or security. Uh, let's take the example of availability. When I say an application is available, we wouldn't, let's assume that in, in case of our e-commerce application, like an Amazon, on a prime day sale, if the application goes down while you're buying that last Xbox, which is available, I think all of us would be very, very disappointed. Ensuring that the uh, application is always available for the end users is an execution quality of the uh, application. Similarly, there are uh, evolutionary qualities. Talk about um, the behavior or the static application code qualities like the maintainability, the scalability, the extensibility. Uh, since uh, since the world has expanded, uh, internet is accessible everywhere in spinning up new geographies and spinning up a new instance on a demand. Uh, it talks about scalability and it is an evolutionary quality of the application. Right. Now that we've spoken about what cross-functional requirements are, let us take a look at some of the critical cross-functional requirements for our uh, example or the uh, scenario or the architecture in consideration. I think if you could. Thanks. Uh, what we've done here is uh, kind of color coded the cross functional requirements these are some of the critical cross, uh, cross functional requirements for the example in consideration the pink refers to the user interface layer the purple uh, define talks about all the other layers of the application and the the last yellow color or the mustard uh, talks about the entire uh, cfrs which cater to the entire application as a whole uh, Let's start with the first uh, the, uh, user interface layer. Uh, I would like to talk about accessibility. In, in today's world where uh, internet is freely available and app is being used by a lot of different kinds of audience, there are laws which mandate uh, accessibility so that the app is always available uh, and can cater to the needs of different uh, differently able people and uh, uh, and all sets of audience, right? And similarly, uh, I think, uh, on this call, there are a lot of us based in different regions. I think it becomes important for the app to cater to the local audience uh, with, with the uh, language and uh, the URL catering to the local region from where the app is being used. And that is where the internationalization or localization comes into picture. Now, moving on to the second uh, category, which is the, uh, uh, the authentication and uh, authorization. I think uh, uh, whenever a user wants to place an order, or if I want to place an order on Amazon, I will have to log in so that I can use all of my safe details and also be able to place the order successfully. So authentication and it becomes very critical over here for, for, for the application to identify the user that is being logged in. Uh, authentication just does not um, end with the UI. 
uh, it also it also has to decide as to who gets access to what in the application and that is where authorization comes into picture and it, it interacts with all of the services in the, all the in the architecture and uh, it allows you to access what you're meant to access right uh, and moving on to uh, the the third third color which is which talks about the cfrs in uh, for the entire application i would like to talk about monitoring uh, monitoring is the ability of the system to collect uh, data and alert you when something is not going wrong. For example, you have many services in your architecture and you want to be notified when one of the services goes down, even before the end user notices it. So alerting and monitoring helps here. So these are some of the CFRs uh, for this example of an e-commerce e platform we have taken. While this is not an ex extensive list, there are many books and blogs that talk about at least 30 30 plus CFRs. The, the need and the uh, kind of CFRs that the application caters to can be decided by the uh, by the businesses and uh, the teams that are building it. And accordingly, there can be a test strategy defined for those. All right. So some of you now might be wondering, how are these cross-functional requirements different from non-functional requirements? The term cross-functional requirements was coined by a thought worker 12 years ago, uh, by a thought worker named Sarah 12 years ago, and it's been used by a lot of folks within our organization and also in the soft in, uh, software industry. Uh, even Sam Newman uh, references to or calls it cross-functional requirements in one of his books, uh, Building Microservices. Uh, like the name says, the requirements uh, and, and it makes a lot of lot more sense to call it cross-functional according to us because the requirements as the name says are spread across the entire application and they have to be built and tested as a part of every feature that is being built especially in thoughtworks we ensure that uh, every every story or every user feature that is being built we do cater, we, we do consider the uh, software uh, the cfrs that need to be accounted for as a part of that feature as well also calling them as non-functional may come across as very non-essential or trivial and uh, might not get the priority it should be getting, which is uh, again, totally against what we want to achieve in the end, which is a high quality software application. Now that we've understood at a very high level uh, what the cross-functional requirements are and why is it important to test them, let's quickly understand uh, what continuous testing is. Continuous testing is a process of validating the quality uh, of, of what the application that is being built by both manual testing and automated testing after every commit, right? And after every change that is happening and, in, and getting notified when there is something that is deviating from the intended quality outcome. Uh, let us take an example. Let us, uh, I'm trying to access Amazon and the page doesn't load. It does not let me, uh, it takes forever for my product to get added to the cart and, and it is leaving me frustrated. How could this have uh, been uh, avoided and not be shown to the end user? Uh, if I had my performance KPIs as a part of uh, being checked as a part of my CI CD, pipelines and have tests that that you know fail when my uh, performance baseline numbers are not being met then it the, the feedback is within the development scope and it still uh, and it can be fixed immediately even before it reaches the end user while ci cd uh, pipelines are one way of continuously getting feedback i think the whole testing process can start uh, before the development itself during the design and prototyping phase where we can uh, everyone is talking about the flows reviewing and uh, reviewing if a particular flow makes sense if it 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 will deliver the intended outcome to the user and during development in the form of unit tests and uh, integration tests which run in your uh, local machine which give you instant feedback rather than wait till the CICD pipeline runs and again on the CICD we, we have both automated for automated test running for functional requirements and non, non cross functional requirements and finally once the application is deployed to the uh, intended environment we, we can always do a manual exploratory testing of various scenarios uh, reviewed by POs, all of these contribute to the continuous testing process. What does continuous uh, uh, what does continuous testing let us achieve? One of the things, one of the key important things is that it shifts the entire testing lift 
so that we get early feedback, we are able to work on it quickly, fix what the issues and deliver a product which is very high in quality. And another major intended outcome of shift flip testing by, by working on continuous testing is that a product is always ready to be shipped, which is the key process that en enables continuous delivery. Now let's take, now that we've understood a little about continuous testing, let's take a look at some of the benefits of continuous testing. The continuous testing when we achieving common quality goals, like I said earlier, testing from the beginning uh, helps us get, get early feedback and helps us build high quality applications, early defect, defect, uh, detection so that the end users do not suffer. Uh, it also increases the collaboration between all the roles on the team, which include, which again in, increases the delivery ownership. It is also enables an, uh, a continuous delivery, which is capability to deliver on de demand, and also enables us to achieve the four key metrics for a high performing team. Now that we've understood continuous testing and what cross-functional requirements are, let us delve into what continuous testing strategy for cross-functional requirements could look like. Uh, Gayatri will take over from you. Thanks, Pallavi. Um, so, so I think uh, uh, um, when we are talking about the continuous testing strategy for uh, cross-functional requirements, um, I just wanted to give some context on why we chose to put focus on this particular topic. Um, so mainly because I think whenever uh, um, automation or continuous testing is uh, spoken about, uh, the functional requirements automation is uh, taken priority, right? Like we know that we need to write our unit tests, we need to write integration tests, service tests, and uh, uh, even UI end-to-end -end automation tests and integrate it with CACD to get that continuous testing feedback for functional requirements. Um, very, very scarcely we see that cross-functional requirements are included into the continuous testing process itself. Um, and uh, that is one of the reasons why uh, we wanted to put focus on to this particular topic and uh, see um, how we can actually approach the continuous testing for CFRs. So uh, one of the feedbacks that we hear when people want to try continuous testing for CFRs is also that uh, CFRs are very abstract, it is very vague, and uh, um, and each of them have uh, their own way of addressing it. And those kind of uh, abstractness uh, keeps them at a distance for people who try to do continuous testing for CFRs. And uh, uh, that is the puzzle that uh, we wanted to um, break down and see if we can provide a simpler approach to uh, continuous testing the cross-functional requirements. Um, so basically, um, uh, let's uh, take a step back and look at uh, the FERBS model, which is a model which is uh, established really long ago uh, for software requirements in general. Um, so the model, the FERBS model is an acronym that stands for uh, these five themes. Uh, F is for functionality, U is for usability, R is for reliability, P is for performance, and S is for supportability. So what the model is trying to tell us is that all of the software requirements, both functional requirements and the cross-functional or non-functional requirements can be bucketed into these five themes. So uh, when we are bucketing it, when what does it uh, qualify to into get into one particular bucket is what you see as the leaflet uh, uh, on the page there. Like for example, in the category of requirements that can be realized as user flows, um, those are functionality team that falls under functionality theme. And the category of requirements that affect the user's experience, right? L um, like the internationalization or uh, cross-browser compatibility, all of those form fall under the usability bucket uh, and uh, any requirement that make the application fault tolerant. Uh, that falls under reliability. This, this is like, for example, you have to uh, uh, include some error, to, error mechanism, error handling mechanisms, um, scalability, all of those things fall under reliability. 
and performance is very obvious. Uh, the, there are performance KPIs like the availability, concurrency, and all of those things that uh, those requirements of an application fall under this bucket. And the last one is the supportability, where we where uh, uh, all the evolutionary code qualities like maintainability, testability, and security, and all of the secure code, all of that fall under the supportability bucket. So this way, uh, we are able to view all the software requirements into these five buckets. And there are testing techniques and testing tools that are available for us to uh, test each of these themes which is what we'll be seeing next and try to apply those testing techniques to arrive at a continuous testing strategy for a particular CFR in the later section of the talk. So what are the testing techniques that are available for each of these themes? Let's take functionality, for example, uh, manual exploratory testing, functional test automation, data testing techniques are there for catering to testing all the functionality related uh, uh, requirements. Although manual exploratory testing is not restricted just to functionality, it can be applied to any team in this uh, model. Uh, mostly manual exploratory testing, I think we can contribute uh, majorly to functionality. Um, so the tools, some of the tools that can help us do that are Postman for APIs, browsers, bug magnet, Charles Proxy, everything. And functional test automation, once again, I think for unit testing, integration testing, um, services, or UA end-to-end -end test automation, there are a bunch of tools that are uh, displayed here that can be used to do the functional test automation part to cover the function, continuous testing of functional requirements. And the data has become an entity of its own in, the, in today's world where there is a separate focus on uh, testing uh, for data quality and everything uh, specific to data. So there are a bunch of tools that uh, help us do continuous testing of uh, data specifically like um, test containers, DQ, great expectations and all of those things. Coming to usability, the testing techniques that will, we can uh, take help from are like visual testing, uh, user experience testing, accessibility testing. So visual, these are some of the established testing mechanisms already. So visual testing is a way where we can compare the screenshots uh, uh, against uh, every incremental change and automate it and get feedback like backstop changes. Uh, Appy tools are some of the established tools that help us do visual testing in an automated fashion. User experience testing. So user experience testing is specifically on the design part of it. It's not even about uh, whether uh, the element is uh, available in the same shape and color as in the design, but actually validating whether the design makes sense for a given user flow and a given set of targeted users. So this is like done using A-B testing tools and also prototype testing tools like user zoom, optimal workshop and um, similar of kinds. And accessibility comes under usability. We need to make sure that uh, the, the assistive devices are uh, uh, the user flows are tested using the assistive devices and also the uh, web page or any other application is in built in a way that can be used by the assistive devices. Some of the tools that could help us in continuous testing process of accessibility are listed here. Uh, this includes both automation and also manual um, exploratory testing of for accessibility in particular. So when it comes to reliability, Um, so stress testing, uh, chaos engineering, infrastructure testing techniques are available for us. And the stress testing is an extended uh, performance testing way where we are actually pushing the application beyond the expected load and making and ensuring whether the uh, application is uh, uh, fault tolerant. Like we are trying to see how much is the stress that it can take and how, how can we make it uh, resilient to falls in terms of uh, stressing it. So some of these established tools are already available for us. And uh, chaos engineering is more of an experimentation methodology uh, where uh, uh, we are trying to uncover uh, some of the behaviors of the application in a turbulent situation. So it is not like an acceptance criteria or an edge case that we're trying to test it out, but rather we are putting the application in a situation where uh, 
uh, it is really turbulent and uh, uh, and we're trying to uncover some of the existing flaws in in the application and trying to uh, make the application resilient and fault tolerant using the testing technique. So these tools could be used to even uh, automate it and uh, um, do it in an automated fashion and to uncover and put fixes to make the application reliable. And infrastructure is one of the backbones of uh, any application. So um, as uh, Pallavi was also mentioning in the beginning of the talk that uh, we are, uh, any application these days is uh, expected to go global and that's when the businesses can uh, gain revenue. So uh, making infrastructure spin up within a click and uh, making uh, infrastructure as code practices have come into picture and uh, therefore ensuring that we are able to uh, test the infrastructure requirements is uh, is become key. So some of these tools are helpful for us to automate the infrastructure as code and perform continuous testing and also make the application reliable in terms of infrastructure availability, um, security and all of those things. When it comes to performance, I think it's an old topic, but back-end performance testing, front-end performance testing has been there for a while. We have tools like um, Lighthouse, web page test, home dev tools for like front end performance testing, and uh, some of the very well established back end performance testing to derive the performance KPIs um, and then structure the um, load accordingly uh, to cater to performance requirements. And lastly, under the supportability category, we have uh, a few of these testing techniques available to us today and the tools that are respectively marked there. So supportability, as we were uh, talking about, is the evolutionary code qualities of the application. So this is where I think um, it gets really vague, like maintainability, extensibility, um, uh, readability, and how do we actually go about testing for them? How do we actually make sure that continuous testing happens for them? So that's where these testing techniques really come into picture and help us. So one of them is the architecture fitness test. So um, to really ensure that whether uh, the architecture that is uh, originally visualized to cater to some of the cross-functional requirements, right? Like, for example, um, all the uh, all the classes and packages should be independent. It should not have cyclic dependency so that it can be reused in another component. So that is like one of the architecture fitness requirements that cater to the CFR maintainability and reusability. So how do we uh, actually test for them? So some of these tools like JDIP and ArcUnit, NetArcUtest, all of those tests are very similar to JUnit. Like they can be written as unit tests just to make sure that all the classes are uh, relate are within the same package or they don't have cyclic dependencies. So those kind of things can be uh, added as automated tests and uh, uh, run as part of the CA pipelines. and to ensure that uh, these sort of supportability related evolutionary code quality related requirements are continuously tested and uh, the feedback is given for the team. So this could look very trivial for a very small team, right? Like uh, all of us are seated on the same table and everything, but when the team really grows and there are multiple streams that are working, Often there are uh, huge trade-offs between that needs to happen, like whether should we cater to performance or whether should we cater to maintainability, like, right? Like, like uh, skipping layers and actually directly calling uh, the database could be performant, but it won't cater to maintainability. So that's where these kind of automated tests will ensure that the um, layering is maintained uh, and it will give feedback in a holistic fashion. And we have static code analyzers that will help us tell uh, whether the readability is maintained, whether there are unused variables. Um, so that gives feedback as early as in the development stage itself. So that is like continuous testing starting from the development stage itself, telling us uh, that these things could be avoided and giving feedback right then and there. Uh, dynamic code analyzers have been in play for a long time as well, like the ZAP DAS test tool, which is uh, the uh, security testing tool, which is uh, which changes the code, uh, injects vulnerabilities, tells us what are the open vulnerabilities, which could be automated and integrated with the CI. PA test is a mutation testing tool, once again, which tells us 
what are the tests or the scenarios that the unit tests could have covered but let it open so those kind of uh, um, uh, tools uh, tell us whether the code uh, is in the place where it can be evolved over time catering to all the supportability related cfrs and linters um, i think again old timers here like es lint which gives feedback on the javascript code for known errors and style in uh, uh, and the ESLint plugin can I use the dot listed here are uh, used for cross browser compatibility like you we can actually make sure that the only the supported features for our supported browser list is being used even during the development stage so that is like the feedback that is got as early as the development stage so some of these aspects actually help us uh, in catering to supportability related CFRs. So uh, I think uh, now uh, I hope the picture is getting carved in all of our minds, like how CFRs um, actually manifest themselves within these five themes. Um, and uh, to make it much more clearer, we'll take a couple of examples and see uh, how these testing techniques um, can be utilized to carve out a continuous testing strategy for a couple of CFRs so that uh, uh, we put the strategy to use. So let's take security. Um, security might seem like a really vast area um, and definitely there is a lot of learning that needs to happen. But uh, going with our strategy that uh, of using the FERPS model and the testing techniques that cater to the FERPS model, let's look at how we can uh, visualize security. So security related requirements, how can it actually manifest themselves, right? Like uh, security related requirements could manifest themselves as functional user flows. So for example, users should be able to uh, go through multi-factor authentication. That's a, like they have to enter their login credentials, they have to enter their uh, OTP, uh, and then go through multiple um, uh, procedures during payment. All of those are functional user flow related requirements that cater to security CFR. And once again, uh, when it comes to security, I think uh, um, one way to look at it is to build a defense mechanism as part of your functionality and core services. The other way to look at security is to um, uh, react to potential security threats. Like, uh, how do we react to it? So that is like making the application fault tolerant. So that is reliability related requirements that will cater to security. And uh, supportability, once again, I think the code should have known, should not have known vulnerabilities at the code level. Uh, how can we actually not inject known depend dependencies that has vulnerabilities in all of this? Uh, writing uh, uh, the code that is not uh, catering to any secure breach, security breaches. So we can see that uh, security requirements can fall under these five themes. And, if we have to borrow the testing techniques from each of these teams, the continuous testing strategy for security will look something like this. So, yeah. Um, so there are uh, uh, static code analyzer tools uh, like uh, Snake, OVASP, dependency checkers that will actually scan the code and uh, scan the static code, give us feedback on uh, known vulnerabilities. So we are utilizing the static code analyzer te technique from supportability to get feedback as early as development. We're also using, pre we could also use pre-commit hooks like Talisman, once again, another static code analyzer, which will actually prevent the team from checking in any known secrets. So that's another way that we could, uh, that, that, and we could, uh, utilized from the supportability category of testing techniques. So these are tools that fall under security related testing under the um, category of static code analysis. And once again, I think we could automate functional automated tests like we were saying like login and all of those things, we could actually do it in the using the functional automated testing tools itself. Um, and the reliability factor we were talking about uh, infrastructure scanning so uh, infrastructure testing related uh, scannings can happen uh, in the CA to give the reliability related uh, requirements feedback um, and dynamic testing is another way we could adopt another testing technique that we could adopt. 
And as always, manual exploratory testing, as I was saying, manual exploratory testing is one of the key things that we could do across all the teams. Um, and uh, once again, since uh, security is uh, one of those areas where um, specialization is needed, I think uh, uh, at the release stage, we could even include the pen testing stage. But um, till then, you could still get the feedback. That's the main uh, part, right? Like continuous testing is to get the feedback immediately as you deviate using manual and automated testing methods. So that's the use of continuous testing and be ready for release. So that's the uh, part till manual exploratory testing. And there are also um, uh, in production, this is another way where uh, uh, reliability testing techniques come into picture. These, these are tools that uh, that will uh, react to the security part, like runtime application, uh, self-protection tools like twist lock and stuff like that, which is put, which can be used to monitor. So those are monitoring and reacting to it. But the continuous testing part, I think, as we can see, as, as a software development team, as we are building the software, uh, we can get uh, uh, the security related feedback as early as a single commit is being pushed into. So um, this is for uh, applying one particular, uh, applying the strategy for one particular CFR, the continuous uh, for security. We can move on to the another uh, um, uh, CFR accessibility and see how we can apply the same strategy. So we're doing this exercise mainly to uh, see um, how we can break down the CFRs. So uh, CFRs need not be just vague and abstract, but uh, just trying to uh, break it down uh, into uh, smaller teams and looking at it from the first model will help us uh, build a continuous testing strategy for that particular CFR. So that's the idea of doing another exercise here. So accessibility. So accessibility, I think, uh, um, once again, if we see, if we break down the requirements of accessibility, what could be the uh, requirements? One is the functional user flows, right? Like um, when, for example, if, you are have, if your application has a video, then one of the functional requirements, the user flow should be that uh, there should be a transcript right beneath it, right? That's the accessibility requirement. So uh, making sure that the user flow includes a video and also a transcript beneath it is one of the functional user flows. And uh, when it comes to usability, I think um, one is user experience testing, the one of the testing technique that we spoke about, right? Like one is user experience testing. The design itself has to be validated to make sure that it is taking the accessibility component into it. One is that. The other one is uh, accessibility in itself uh, uh, is one of the usability testing technique, right? Like uh, being able to work with assistive devices and uh, ensuring that uh, it is compatible um, is one of the things that falls under usability category of requirements. And supportability, once again, the code should have appropriate uh, uh, accessibility related uh, um, st static requirements, like the tag should be there, all text should be there. So all of those things ensure that the code uh, can be evolved um, in a proper way that caters to accessibility. So um, we can visualize accessibility requirements to be manifesting across these buckets. This is majorly uh, across these buckets and uh, how we can see how we can adopt some of those um, uh, testing techniques that we spoke about earlier to build a continuous testing strategy for accessibility. So like we were saying, the design and analysis, like when it comes to accessibility, the design itself has to be uh, validated and make sure that the user experience part is calculating the accessibility requirements. Um, so there we start, uh, continuous testing starts from the design phase. During development, again, we can take a, uh, help from the static code analysis that are available to ensure that the code has the right uh, accessibility, DOM built, the tags are available and all of those things. And there are also runtime checkers for us, which can be used for uh, um, runtime evaluation uh, and giving us feedback like the tools mentioned here. 
once again, functional tests like we were talking about, like either be it a unit test or a integration test or a UA end to end test, making sure that the accessibility related requirements are automated and they're giving the continuous feedback. And manual testing, once again, uh, as you keep uh, emphasizing, manual exploratory testing is a feature that we can apply to any of those themes. And once again, for uh, accessibility, manual exploratory testing could be done using some of these tools and also using assistive devices like screen readers or keyboard functional tool. But the message is um, how we, we can uh, uh, decompose accessibility to uh, into multiple buckets and uh, take help of our uh, testing techniques and tools to get that continuous feedback right from design till manual testing phase. Uh, and of course, during the release testing phase, we could also employ our uh, uh, user uh, testing uh, with the real users and also the certification. So this is uh, uh, on a whole how we can um, achieve continuous testing for a CFR like accessibility. So uh, here, I think we're talking about a couple of CFRs and I think uh, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, if you're looking for actual implementation uh, and uh, uh, knowledge of existing tools and everything, the book has more of it. Uh, I just wanted to mention if people are interested, uh, take a look at it. I'm also happy to give away three ebooks uh, uh, for the participants here. Please leave your email addresses uh, in the chat and I'll be able to send across three ebooks. Apart from that, um, uh, the key takeaways that uh, um, from this session, uh, we want to leave the uh, folks here with our. CFRs define the executional and evolutionary qualities of an application. CFRs are as essential as functional requirements for the application success. Functional and cross-functional requirements together make the application a high quality product. So, um, so far, uh, if a functional, like we saw in the example in the beginning, or if businesses try to prioritize the functional requirements, it is us who should be uh, encouraging them to look at the benefits of inculcating cross-functional requirements as early and uh, preach them about the quality aspect of it and be able to advocate for it. And the CFRs can be visualized along the FERPS theme. It need not be as vague as possible. It can be broken down into simpler themes along the lines of the FERPS model. And there are testing techniques and tools that can be used to conduct continuous testing for each of the FERBs theme. So we are not left alone. We do have support with respect to testing techniques and tools for the CFRs. Although functional, functional requirements, automation and continuous testing has been prevalent, I think uh, the parallelly the cross-functional requirements, testing techniques and tools have also been evolving parallelly and we should be able to make use of them to gain the benefit of continuous delivery. And- uh, Gayatri, just a time check, we are at 4.45. Uh, okay. Yes, that, that, that's about it. I think uh, we were just going to say, uh, therefore, continuous testing of CFR is very much feasible and uh, should be included in your testing strategy. So uh, I'm not sure if we have time, but I'll be there and both of us will be there in the Hangouts. Um, and uh, for folks who are generally interested to check out the book, here is a 30-day uh, free trial. And... Um, uh, that's open for you to check out as well. If you are interested to learn more in this area, get practical implementation knowledge and all of those things. Uh, well, we do not see any QA uh, there. Okay, fine. Uh, we will then wrap the session. Uh, thanks for your insights, uh, Gayatri and Pallavi. Thank you, folks. Thanks for participating actively. See you.